Good afternoon. Um, I'm Dimitris Kiritsis from uh, uh, the Ecole Polytechnique Federal de Lausanne in Switzerland. So I'm uh, an academic, a professor in a technical university. I'm, I think I'm among the two or three academics that are here, so it's a privilege for me. And I would like to present to you some uh, academic research perspective on the work that we do to explore big industrial data on for predictive maintenance, but also there are other applications as far as I understand. And from what I know so far, so there are so many data collected by in various domains by industry today, but the industry is able to explore only 1% from this data, from what I learned from them. So we are in a group of research proposing um, uh, semantic modeling solutions, semantic solutions, semantic technologies to, to face this problem. Uh -huh, okay. Good. So, um, predictive maintenance, so why, why we need maintenance? To, let's say, to correct or to bring back assets, machines, products that they function to their good functional quality. And why we go to bad quality? Because we have degradation which is a natural phenomenon. Degradation, it happens to our bodies also, to every aspect of life, also to machines, because of friction and because of uh, um, phenomena, physical phenomena that you know much better than me. And you have various strategies, so this is linked to reliability also, that you know very well, and you have various strategies to, to address these problems. Um, and then um, it, is, it will be better to prevent failures. So you have preventive maintenance, so if you have a failure, then you have corrective maintenance, etc. And now, we, in this kind of meetings, and also in research, we um, um, develop predict predictive and prescriptive uh, technologies to take actions before, uh, to, 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 let's say, to detect the problem and take action before a failure happens. So in order to do that, we need to understand <coughs> and measure degradation. So by modeling. Also, modeling is the tools of, of engineers, various aspects of modeling. And we may build, so maybe it is not so visible here, maybe for you it's better, but we may have functional models, all the functions and what we can measure on each function, for example, RPMs or speeds or uh, displacements or whatever. And also the information flows that you may, we may measure from each function to the other. And we can associate to this functional model what we call the gradation model. If something, let's say, is close to fail to one functional element, may propagate to another one. And then when you detect a degradation or a failure, maybe it's not due to a defect of the function that do you observe, but something before. So this kind of modeling may help understand better and measure degradation. And what we want to avoid with all this modeling and prevention is to avoid defects. This is what, <coughs> what they cure and may, may occur at various levels. And one, where we want to, to avoid defects is mainly at the products, because we sell products and we cannot afford to sell products with defects, of course. And um, how defects may be produced or uh, um, observed. So maybe produced because of failure of material, so on a product, or maybe produced be before, because of a degradation of a machine, of an asset of the process and these are correlated so our strategies have to let's say to observe both the product life cycle and the process life cycle to optimize the uh, good behavior of, of both product lives and process lives and um, from our perspective so we we talked also in the um, plenary meetings about this concept of closed loop observations, closed loop life cycle management. And this is a, 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 a diagram that shows how the information flows. Flow from the uh, producers, uh, here, yes, that produce and deliver products to users. And there they are served by various operators and service providers. And you have all types of flows, data and information flows and transformations that they go from each actor to the other in order to optimize, to do maintenance, to do uh, d make decisions about end of life, to optimize operations. And this is possible today um, because of the embedded devices, we call them product embedded information devices that are embedded to the system, sensors, ID devices, etc. And uh, they allow this wireless and seamless communication and 
flow of information to the various actors to, al to allow them to take, to take decisions. So we developed this concept of closed-loop lifecycle management more than 10 years ago in a collaborative European project. And this is, I believe, the background concept of the uh, Industry 4.0 reference model, which is developed recently by uh, German stakeholders with the strong participation of ACP, which was behind the concept model that I pre presented to you before. It includes all the life cycle aspects and the devices, the embedded devices that uh, are used to that. Also, you have to consider that we live in a, uh, in a world of system of systems. It's not just systems that we address. It's system of systems. So uh, the colleague here presented the uh, windmills that are in, in, uh, in fleets in uh, complex environments. So the environment itself in the sea, etc., it's a system by itself, the environment. And the uh, windmill is also a system by itself. And he, uh, when we produce this kind of product, so this looks like a washing machine, at the beginning of its life it's a thing. When it is produced, it's an instance of thousands of similar products. Each one has its own ID and its own life. It's a, a fleet, let's say. And then using the industrial internet of things and the connected devices, products and systems, all these fleets, they contribute to provide data to the uh, data, to the data centers or cloud, if you want. And this data may be used, let's say, to complete. So in the, in the panel, you hear that when you have you don't have, let's say, correct data or failures of one instance of a product, you may, let's say, provide similar data to complete the data set from other similar products. So this kind of approach helps to, to, to solve this problem. And <coughs> at the end, the whole system within the industrial Internet of Things and cyber physical systems, uh, they link all the stakeholders, manufacturers, users, service providers, and allows, it's, in my opinion, it's, a, it's about big data, life cycle data transformations. Data flow and are transformed every time. They transform to what? To information. And based on the information, we take decisions. And at the end, they are transformed to knowledge. And based on the knowledge, we design new improved products for the next generation or, or we improve existing products. And in this, uh, oh no, here, in this thing here, you have the life cycle phases from the beginning of life middle of life and end of life. Middle of life is, for example, maintenance activities and a lot of data are generated there, there that can be used in the end of life to decide when it is the time of retirement of something that you are using and feedback information to the beginning of life to design, to, to, to design better new products and go from some meters to 195 meters windmills, for example. And <coughs> what type of information, what type of data we have to, to to deal with. So this is a slide of a colleague of mine from NIST that I, I took it. So all this data, so from the design up to the manufacturing, are of many kind. So there are linguistic data, communication, even verbal communication, text. There are um, pictural data, drawings, even pictures, sketches. There are symbolic data, numbers or um, formulas. Um, they are virtual data, 3D models, simulation models. Virtual means not that they do not exist, but they are computer generated by computers. They are algorithmic data, results of algorithmic processes. And we have to combine all of them. And then <coughs> we need, so in order to be able to explore not more than 1% of this data, I think that at least in the engineering domain and not in other domains like social domain with Facebook, etc., in the engineering domain we have to go beyond the first appearance of data, numbers, and understand the meaning of this data. And <coughs> if we look at this, so what we have? For the data, we have a source of data. I will give you an example to, to tell you what I mean as source of data. Data have values. Data work and have meanings within a context. Uh, they are transformed. They, we need to interpret the data to take decisions. We can visualize them. We have to take all, all these considerations into account. And what <coughs> I, I mean by meaning of data? Take this example, 38.5 degrees of Celsius. It's a piece of data. In, the, in my body, if I measure this 
value in my body with a thermometer, this is fever for me. I don't feel well. I don't go to work. I stay home. Maybe I call the doctor or I, or I take uh, paracetamol or something. If this value is measured in a sensor of an oven, you will never eat the pizza that you want to cook in this oven. You have to wait 200 degrees. So what is the source of data in each of the cases? Is it the sensor? Maybe for the information system or the computer scientist, it, it is the sensor. But for me, I'm an engineer, it is not the sensor. It's the physical phenomena that runs on my body and makes me have this fever. And I need to understand that to take decision. Or the medicine doctor needs to understand that to give me the good medicine to address this. So similar things happen to all kinds of data. I think we, we need to go beyond what we read and find the source and understand what, what was the reason, the cause to go there. So how we, we formalize this, how we go, uh, let's say, and capture this meaning of data. So there is this kind of, let's say, technology. We call it semantics because it goes to find the semantics of numbers, the meaning of numbers. And what it says, it works like our mind more or less works. So in our mind, when we see the word, we um, have a perception of entities. So we have in our mind the perception, the entity of a chair or of a table or for a computer. The computer doesn't have this capacity. So we need to describe it with very details, what is a chair, etc. Now, with this kind of techniques, we have the computing capability to teach the computer to understand entities with these uh, semantic technologies. In philosophy, they call, uh, they call them ontologies. Ontology on, so by the way, I'm Greek, I understand it's a Greek word, I understand very well. On is something that exists and how to deal with, how to understand these kind of things that they exist in the real world around us. And the words that you see in, in the various links here are relations that are exist between these entities. And our mind, also our memory works in that way. We have entities and relations between these entities. And in this example, so this 38, sorry, this 38 point degrees, so we may create this network, it's a representation network, we can associate as a body temperature or as a oven temperature, and then these temperatures are qualities, and also um, these uh, qualities in here in the oven or in the body, and both of them are material entities. Also, this value is read in a sensor device, which is a sensor, which is an object, and which is a material entity. Why we need all this graph? Because we want to create the structure of the communication semantically between the computers as we have a structure to communicate in our languages that we speak and communicate together, exploring the, capacity, the capabilities of our mind. And <clears throat> even if I, I want to go a little bit better, so we don't want to define these entities in all the domains. So these entities that you have here, all of them, some of them are taken for ontology, similar graph that they are defined in other domains. BFO is a basic formal ontology. EAO is the information or artifacts ontology, and so on and so forth. So we define in various communities entities once, and we may reuse them in other com com uh, communities. This will help a lot to solve the interoperability problem among systems. First at the semantic model, at the understanding model uh, level, sorry, and then if we agree on this semantic model, which is very basic, then we can go to technical, syntactical and technical interoperability, how the software pieces, they will make systems work together. So <coughs> this approach may help to collect all this heterogeneous data that come from various sources, in various forms, in various files, uh, etc. and be a part of the uh, system. The other part of the system is domain knowledge. So we talked about experts also in many talks. So we have experts that they have the rules, they have the expertise of the domain. We can combine both and build ontologies, learning from data, learning from domain knowledge. And this uh, helps to create these so-called knowledge graphs. Knowledge graphs are graphs based on ontologies that they go up to the big data. 
you know Netflix, you know YouTube, you do searches there. All of them, they work following this kind of principles. And then on these knowledge graphs, which are populated by data, we can apply various types of th algorithms, data analytical algorithms on data sets that are pre-processed -pro -pre and enriched semantically on data that they have some meaning. And this they can help to create meaningful reports for predictive maintenance, for example, or prescriptive maintenance. And <coughs> the way that, of course, we apply um, data analytics are uh, the standard one. So we gather the data, we structure the data, in our case, in this form of knowledge graphs. We analyze these knowledge graphs, we classify them, etc. We can take decisions and uh, we can repeat the process until we have um, the results that we want on the amount of data that we want. So, of course, <coughs> so far, so maybe this technology of semantic technologies or odology are known or not known to you. But if you do it, you do it for yourself. Other colleagues or companies similar to you as they do it for themselves. And maybe the semantics, the odologies themselves are not interoperable at all. So we need to agree on that. And what we did, so some a couple of years ago, I had the privilege together with a colleague of mine to initiate the creation of a community. We call it Industrial Odologies Foundry with support of uh, NIST and also of, of the European Commission through various projects. NIST is the National Institute of Standards and Technologies. Well-known companies like Dassault Systems and Airbus and Autodesk and the US military forces and others are associated to that. And what is the purpose? Is the purpose is to allow communities to create these semantic models, these ontologies in their own domain, allow them to pass through a process of technical um, check so that they become uh, uh, more general to be used in practice. And after various iterations and maturity, hopefully they will become standards to share data globally and among various players and contribute to solve the interoperability problem which is, which is um, uh, uh, very, very serious. Um, we follow, let's say, uh, an hierarchy to that. So as I told you, so we start from various basic uh, concepts and entities that are generic because we need to understand the world from its origins, let's say. And this is a kind of top-level odology that we adopted. It's called basic formal odology, and it has only 14 entities to define, to, to define physical uh, continuance, that they are static, and temporal continuance, con uh, te temporal uh, entities, continuance and occurrence. And we have various types of odologies to define entities that are used in more generic way, ways, like, for example, like agents, like time like processes or domain level ontologies like product life, life cycles or manufacturing or um, um, skills and then specific ontologies like materials or specific type of materials or specific type of manufacturing processes like additive manufacturing and these are entities that are used by by everybody and if we agree how we define them then we can work together among different stakeholders. And at the lower level, when we have application ontologies in your own domain, this you can keep it for yourself. It's your IP. But since it is based on commonly agreed terms, then you can easily share what you want to develop also with others and explore this interoperability, let's say compliance in your own systems as well. So this is, in a, let's say, the basic, a basic slide for this basic formal ontology when we have some entities of continuance, material, for example, or of uh, occurrence, like processes and temporal duration, temporal regions, etc. And this slide is to show just an, an example from the health sector and why from the bio and health sector, because the application of this kind of technologies is successful in this sector. You know the genome. The genome is described in a unique ontology and it is used by everybody in the world following this approach in medical applications, in pharma applications with success. And we want to copy somehow or adapt this successful model to the industrial odology foundry. So they have also in this domain a foundry, they call it Obo Foundry. Uh, and we, we work 
towards creating this uh, kind of fun foundry in the industrial domain. And this shows that from the basic concept of a continuum, for example, or a uh, occurrent, you may go up to values. And what you have here, all this data, if you treat, let's say, um, apply algorithms to this data, and then you, go, you want to repeat operations and share this data, following this structure, each data will be associated correctly through the semantic structure to its peers, etc. <coughs> we developed a, specific, uh, let's say, a domain uh, reference ontology for the product life cycle, which is important for the management of the assets, their maintenance, etc. So you have three types of entities. So material entities, when you have the products, the physical, the materials, the infrastructure, the uh, roads, the buildings, etc. You have information entities, which is associated to that. And on these informations, we take decisions about almost everything that concerns the life of, of a product or an asset. And we have the process entities to, to control, to control the flow of information and to control the life from the beginning, the design, up to the end of, this, of its life. So we apply these concepts in my team together with other partners in many European-funded projects and uh, that are addressing these three elements here. So data integration and exchange of heterogeneous data uh, for, for big industrial data, a provision of uh, data set to support tools to do simulations, digital twins, for example, we have projects to implement digital twins and visualization of domain knowledge of uh, big data. One case that I would like to present, also to briefly present to you, which is relevant to predictive or predictive manufacturing maintenance for zero defect manufacturing, because we don't do predictive maintenance for maintenance. So to expand or to have good quality of life assets and avoid defects, both in the processes, in the machines, and uh, at the products. So this is a production, uh, let's say, uh, facility which uses machine tools and which uses measurement machines for the quality insurance. And <coughs> the concerns that we have here, so this is a flow, so you have the CAD file, which is used, read by a machine to produce a physical, a physical product, which is then measured. And you have data all along these processes, and we have various issues that you have in many, in many companies, so you have what are the good data sets, how to combine the measurement files of the product with the process files, how to correlate them, are, are they are complete. We don't have many examples of failures, how to, how to complete this data sets of failures to, let's say, to, to use, how to combine expertise to complete this data sets about failures, I mean, to take decisions about maintenance. And we also um, follow some, some strategies for um, uh, to, to arrive to non-defective parts through predictive methods. First, first of all, we have to detect if there is a, a, a kind of degradation or a, or a defect. Then if we have the defect, are we able to predict it? And how? What are the features? What are the patterns? And if we detect it, what we can do? We can do prescriptions, repair or prevent. If we can prevent it, it will be even better. If we cannot prevent and we have defects, is it possible to repair them or we have to throw them away? <coughs> So the challenges, as I said already, is that we have data with no maintenance annotation. So we, we have the data, but we don't have the explanations of the data. So how to do that? And we have heterogeneous data sources, as I said before. So we developed a kind of architecture, a framework, when we have the data management at the process layer, and we have the data uh, themselves, that are streams of data in the physical layer, streams or in the cloud. And using the technology that I presented before, we organize them in the semantic framework that we call it. We produce the knowledge graph and we apply to this knowledge graph applications for maintenance, for digital twins, for various types of decision support systems. And we create reports or visualize, create various visual visualizations as we wish in various types of terminals. So <coughs> we organize this uh, semantic model according to the approach that I explained to you. So material entities, information entities, um, um, time respective or product continuum respective. And here, if you may see, it is a kind of ontology um, observed, uh, let's say, presented as a taxonomy, because ontologies are also taxonomies. And the first ontology that created many thousands of years ago, it's about the human species or the species. Mammals. Aristotle started with that, with the seven categories of 
living organizations. And based on that, in order to implement, we created also a, a semantics-driven architecture to develop solutions when we are using standards like RDF files, resource data formats, triple stores. You may be aware of that, that they allow to implement ontologies in software systems and to organize the data in these triple stores when we can apply stream data or stored data with the appropriate algorithms to um, um, create decision also. We can retrieve knowledge from that or we can create knowledge from that. It is easy to extend ontologies. And if we add a class in the ontology, an entity is already a piece of knowledge that we add in our knowledge network. This explains the previous slide, what I, I said before. And this is, I think, the, the last slide when we created, we implement, uh, implemented an application using open source software like uh, Fireware. Maybe you are aware of that, or IDS connectors to collect the data, to link them together, to provide them to uh, apps, various apps for predictive maintenance or quality uh, control. And uh, this was also, the, you see the same product here that I showed you before. And we visualize them and create the reports in various types of dashboards, in various types of terminals. So this was my short story for today. Thank you very much for your attention. And if you want to know more, just contact me through the, yeah, the slides will be available. Thank you.